Yes, so some for the new ones, welcome uh, here to the Martin e. Siegel Theatre Centre at the Grady Centre CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke and I'm the director of the Siegel Centre. Next to me is Christine Scarfoto, a dramaturg and the producer of the Penwald Voices Festival. And this is, ends the day two of our Penwald Voices Festival. This is the fifth play, I think we are showing. And we have with us tonight a very a special guest, a great, a great uh, writer in um, soccer terms. He would be a world champion in chess. He would be a grandmaster, I think. And, uh, but this is Roland Schimmelfennig, who is here with us. Golden Dragon, you might have known from the play company, Arabian Nights and other uh, uh, productions. He actually happens to live in Cuba. And it's one of the reasons why we were able also to have a Cuban writer. He helped us also to bring someone over and said, this is important, we have to have an ongoing dialogue. So thank you so much for, uh, a, for making this also um, happen. Um, Penwell Voices was created by Selman Rushdie and Paul Austros under the time of the Bush uh, administration, someday regime. And uh, where there was a real tunnel vision in America and, uh, and they felt we needed to hear voices from the outside world. Over 95% of all publications were just American or in the English language. From the 5%, uh, 50 to 60% were French or German because these countries enjoy, which I think is a good thing, strong government support. But it meant only two or three out of 100 books really came from somewhere else with like a completely different view or new view or historically or from, from, from a current culture. And as we know in world music, how significant it is for musicians to listen to what people do around the world, how it influenced them also to find their own voices. Um, they felt it is significant to create the Penn Festival, which is ongoing now. We have the program in your program here. It's like a 10 day festival with really great novelists writers and poets, and we here at the Siegel Center fought very hard to include playwrights because we felt strongly that's also where they um, belong. Um, the Siegel Center bridges academia and professional theater, international and American theater, so of course a festival like this is uh, right in the center of what we do. It's our eighth time as a participation, and I also would like to welcome uh, the play company who produced many of Shimon Fanny's uh, play, Barbara. Uh, one of the literary agents, and Antje Oegel, who also is here, who works with us and will also work with the Siegel Center. And um, this is it. The last thing is, please do take out your phone, and I'll do the same, and just check it. If, the, if it's off, it actually never rings. It's really, really true in our readings in 10 years so far. So um, well, let's not jinx that tonight, yeah. And so this is off, and Christine. I also wanted to thank um, our wonderful director, Devin DeMaio, all the way from Chicago, uh, for directing this reading uh, today. And without any further ado, um, Ant Street. by Roland Schimmelfennig. The grandmother, the mother, the daughter, and the daughter's boyfriend are sitting on a sofa. Something has happened, an accident. They might have their heads bandaged, crutches, bones in splints, bleeding, missing teeth. The sofa is too small for all of them. Nobody wants to begin. The snowflake, uh, a single, a single snowflake, a single white snowflake fell from the night sky, yet it was so hot. The daughter, a young woman, looks for her crutches and stands up. She tries to take a few steps. She presses the button on an air conditioning unit lying on the floor in front of the sofa, but the air conditioning is broken. She goes back to the sofa and sits down. It was a hot night, 95 degrees. I was standing by the open window. I'd just taken off my shirt, it was so hot. He takes off his shirt, which is dripping with sweat. And I was looking out onto the street. I watched the traffic, the cars, the trucks, and then I looked up at the sky, and, and there I saw the snowflake. 
I don't know, have you ever seen a snowflake? A... The snowflake fell and fell. It fell out of the clear, starry sky. It got blown past the windows of a big hotel, down, down the street on the corner, corner of... Uh... And then the snowflake got blown along the street. Every car swept it a little further and it flew up into the air and back down onto the ground. And then, then a gust of wind blew it in through our window. And then the snowflake landed very softly, very, <coughs> very softly, very gently on her knee. On her knee. She only had a short dress on. Dark. The lights went off. The electricity went off. What was that? <clears throat> it was a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of snowflake? And then there was a knock. Someone knocked on the door in the dark. And I said, Who's there? And someone outside said, I've got a package for you. A what? A package. He had waited and waited for 42 years. Daughter sees an ant on the floor. He'd been waiting for that package for 42 years. 42 years, standing at the roadside. Imagine that. Daughter eats the ant. At the roadside, one foot on the sidewalk, one foot in the street beside the electricity mast. We, we've got ants in the kitchen. Everybody's got ants in their kitchen, haven't they? But us, we've got a whole street of ants. And sometimes, sometimes you just stand still and watch the ants, don't you? The man's been standing in the street for 42 years waiting for a package. And the cars, the trucks, the people, everything passes him by hour after hour, day after day. The ants are always running backwards and forwards, and nothing ever changes. One foot in the street, one foot on the sidewalk, always beside the electricity mast. Nothing ever changes, ever. The ants are always running back and forth, sometimes more, sometimes less. A lot in the daytime, fewer at night. And they're always looking for something. For 42 years. He's been waiting there since he was a young man, and now he's old, and he's still waiting in the same place. They're always looking for something, always hoping something is going to happen. But they'll find a grain of rice, just like grandfather, standing in the street, waiting for something that never comes. And then, then nothing does come. But sometimes somebody gets run over. <laughs> Stand there all day. Sometimes I put something in the way of one of the ants. A crumb, a dead fly. And then, then the ants are pleased. Then they get really excited. And sometimes I eat an ant. One of them falls by the wayside on the great ant highway. And, and maybe he'd just been given a grain of rice out of the blue. But my boyfriend, I've got a boyfriend. <laughs> My boyfriend thinks that he's generally, sometimes I think he's, he's, he's not ill or anything. <laughs> <laughs> he only ever talks about love. Even watching TV, and he sees snowflakes in the summer. He says things like, a snowflake falls gently on her knee. <laughs> and it's just water dripping from the ceiling because Maria Papa's washing machine is broken on the floor above. First, the water spills over onto the floor upstairs, and then the wires get wet, and then there's a short circuit. The electricity cuts out darkness. Washing machine, water, floor, wires, short circuit. <laughs> Maria! Maria Papa! When, tell me, when are you finally going to get your washing machine repaired? You're flooding the whole house! Darkness. 
No light. But the way he stood in the street that afternoon, grandfather, that was... You should have seen that. You should all have seen that. The way he stood there that afternoon. The boyfriend plays the grandfather in the sun. The cars go speeding past him. The waiting. But he'd already been waiting for 42 years. That afternoon, he suddenly got up out of his chair and said, today the package is com com is going to come. How he knew that. Today. Everyone was waiting for the package. The whole street was waiting for the package by now. The whole neighborhood. And everybody was talking about it. Every morning in the queue for the bakery, that was the topic of conversation. The package, the package, the package. You understand. You all understand. Whether it had come yet, that it would never come, and it never did. And our neighbor, Maria Peppa, said, a package has never come for anyone in our street, never. And it's the district council's fault, or the post office. Um, with the post office, and my grandmother said, what nonsense, and then, and then, Maria Peppa said, who knows if they ever sent the package. A package probably won't ever come, these things are easily said. And one morning, in the queue for the bakery, she quietly said to someone, perhaps they're just trying to sound important with this package of theirs. <laughs> she said it quietly, but not quietly enough, because I have very good hearing, I have very, very good hearing, my mother said. She said, my hearing is too good. I always hear what I'm not supposed to hear. And I asked my grandmother what it meant, perhaps they're just trying to sound important with this package of theirs. And my grandmother set off. She went up to Maria Peppa. She walked past the whole queue and said, Maria Peppa, it's one thing to be envious, and it's another to be resentful, and another to be a pessimist, too. But all three will make you sick, and it will damage the neighborhood. <laughs> and Maria Peppa said, oh, sorry. Sorry, the post office probably opened the package last Christmas. If I worked for the post office, that's what I would do. And my grandmother said, that is precisely why you don't work for the post office. <laughs> and then she came back here and she said, not even the post office would employ her, and the post office will employ anybody. <laughs> they even took my cousin, my grandmother's sister's son, though she's actually only a half-sister, but family is family. And his son, I mean, my grandmother's sister's son's son. Uh, the post office took him off, too, but they lived down south, not here. And then it was our turn. We bought our bread. And then we went back home. And the moment the door was closed, my grandmother said, Maria Peppa is just a jealous slut. If she'd had her way, she'd have married your grandfather over 40 years ago. But what she didn't know was I was already pregnant. And then she clicked her tongue. <laughs> and then he got up and said, today. You should have seen it. He was sitting in his chair, and then suddenly he said, it's coming today. He got up, and he walked out of the door. You should have seen it, how excited he was when he saw the car coming from far away. As soon as the car appeared over the brow of the hill, how he waved. It was a miracle. It really was a miracle. <sighs> and then his disappointment. He'd seen the car when it was still more than 10 miles away. <laughs> he was so excited, like a child. It was like his brother himself was coming. Yes, it was as if his brother himself was coming. The last time he'd seen his brother was 42 years ago, you know. How can that happen? A family falling apart like that. We are a family, and yet I've never met his brother. So, you can imagine. What an exciting moment it was for all of us, for the whole street, I think for the whole neighborhood. You understand. The car would stop at the same spot where his brother had got on the bus 42 years ago. With his bag over his shoulder and nobody, nobody had thought that we would never hear from him again. He didn't come to our wedding. He didn't come to the funerals, no phone call. No letter, but now, I don't understand it. I don't understand these things. She wipes away a tear, perhaps. How do you get a spark? How do you get a short circuit like that? Do you know how that happens? We always lose our electricity when Maria Peppa on the floor above tries to put her washing machine on, <laughs> except when there's no water. But only the car doesn't stop. 
wasn't a messenger, not a mailman, not a package. It was just a car that came over the brow of the hill and drove past the house, like 110,000 other cars do every day. And next to the driver sat a particularly ugly woman who was picking her nose. <laughs> and then the car, like 110,000 others, disappeared into the darkness. And when he came back in again, when my grandfather came back into the house again, when he sat down, and when nobody knew what to say, and then when you cry, the boyfriend cries, the daughter cries too, everyone cries. But let's not be sad. I don't like crying. If there's one thing I hate, it's crying. Let's, let's put on the TV instead. The group stares straight ahead and sings or hums the theme tune of a television program. And after that, we watched our favorite TV show. We always watch this show. I love this show. But it wasn't like it usually is. Usually. Normally, we watch our TV show and we see how the evil housekeeper blackmails her boss. <laughs> or how the man with the gold chain around his neck cheats on his wife. But this time, all we were trying to do was not look at the man who was crying. That's what it was all about. Mama held his hand, but she didn't look at him. My boyfriend talks about love. He's <clears throat> romantic. Maybe he's too romantic with all this nonsense, but sometimes he has good ideas. And then my boyfriend started talking about the snowflake, even though it can't really have been a snowflake. It was a hot night, 95 degrees. I was standing by the open window. It was so hot, I'd taken off my shirt. And then I looked up into the sky, and I saw the snowflake. It was falling out of the clear, starry sky. It got blown past the windows of the large hotel, down, down onto the street at the corner of... And then the snowflake got blown down the street, and each car wafted it a bit further. It flew high up into the air and back down to the ground, and then, then, a gust of wind blew it in through our window. And then the snowflake landed very softly, very very softly, very gently, on her knee. She only had a, a short dress on. Look! Look, 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 look at that! What's that? What is that? She shouted, look, look! And I thought she was talking about the TV. She screamed, look at that! What's that? What is that? What's that? What is that? And then, Maria Peppa, washing machine, flooding, short circuit, darkness. Maria! Maria Peppa! The electricity always goes off when we want to watch this show, always! Blackout. Darkness. Maria Peppa, I hate you! <laughs> and my grandfather said in the dark, it was a snowflake. And then there was a knock in darkness. A knock. Who's there? Thunder. I open the door. In the dark of the hallway, there's a black shadow. You can't make out anymore. But then there's a flash of lightning, and you can see the tall silhouette of a man. Thunder. Ah! For a fraction of a second in the flash of light, I can see the outline of a man who's holding something in his hand, but I can't make out what it is. It's too dark. There's a roll of thunder and another flash. It's a package. The man lit up by the lightning is holding a package in his hand. The man says nothing. Do I need to sign something? I say, wait, I'll give you a tip. She looks for some change. But the man has suddenly disappeared, as if he's vanished into thin air. Finally, someone finds a candle. And everybody stares at the package, the package in Mama's hands. A moment of silence. <clears throat> maybe, maybe we shouldn't open it. What? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't open it. <clears throat> Who knows what's inside? There's a thunderstorm? Thunder. <laughs> Everyone stares at the package in the candlelight. It had grandmother's name on it. Maybe the package had been on its way for 42 years. You don't really think we're not going to open the package. <laughs> you can't believe that. The mother gives the boyfriend the package. When the TV people finish the show, just when it's got exciting. When the blonde with the huge mansion, for example, who's married to the man with the gold chain, 
finds out who her real father is, for example, or when the wicked housekeeper says she's pregnant and we don't know by whom, and it's meant that we've got to watch again next week. But I hate it even more when we miss our show because Maria Peppa has electrified the whole house. <laughs> we miss the entire episode and all because of Maria Peppa. And Grandfather stood there in the dark with the package and the package was huge. I was afraid Grandfather <coughs> would collapse under the weight. I said, I'll help you. But he laughed and said, this package is lighter than it looks, girl, no problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. We had pictured so many times what might be inside the package, but our powers of imagination weren't strong enough. I tried to imagine what I would put in the package, like this. If I had a brother I hadn't seen in 42 years, and I knew that grandfather was thinking about this too, what would he put in a package to send to his brother? What should he send him? Did he, the brother, not miss the smell of the dampness of the rain? The heat in summer on the asphalt? Or the queue for the bakery? But there are things that you can't put inside a package. The sound of the cars, the, the dogs barking in the street, the hens, the shouting. I hate you, Maria Peppa! I hate you and your washing machine! <laughs> and my boyfriend, this idiot, sometimes he really is an idiot, he said, maybe it would be better if we didn't open the package. That really was a stupid idea. <laughs> But it's always good to have an intellectual in the family. <laughs> Where on earth did you find him? <laughs> and then the light came back on. It wasn't in the package. Maybe it would have been better if we hadn't opened. The things in the package were not what we'd been hoping for. In the package were one ballpoint pen with Flor de Lotus written on it, uh, one 10-year-old pocket calendar, and a blonde wig, and tiny little packets of laundry powder that, uh, that, that you call testers. My boyfriend said people give, are given them as advertising. And the pen, too, that's another gift, probably from a Chinese restaurant. And, and the old calendar, that's, uh, that's from Western Union. That's another gift, a, a promotional gift, a really old promotional gift. <laughs> yes, and there was no letter inside. Oh, that's strange. I mean, there must be some sort of a letter with it. It was just an empty jar with mustard written on it, wrapped up in newspaper in a language nobody could understand. And a spoon. That was the best. As if we didn't have any spoons. <laughs> Perhaps we'd have been better off if we'd just thrown the whole lot in the garbage. And I'd phone somebody whose electricity hadn't gone off to ask what happened on the TV show. <laughs> but I didn't think of that at the moment. Because... Because... The calendar was empty. The empty calendar. Empty as a desert, full of days with nothing in them, no notes, no meetings, events, every day the same, a day like any other, white. But it was a pocket calendar from the company Western Union, black, nothing special. But it wasn't a normal calendar. It was a door. The calendar was a door or a window. The year of the calendar was constantly changing. It would be last year's calendar, and then it would be the calendar from 30 years ago, or even older. It could change constantly. But it was always empty. And in the newspaper, which was written in a language nobody could understand. In the newspaper, there would suddenly be a story you could read. Uh, October 30th, the Sanchez Circus comes to town. Sanchez. Sanchez. Sanchez? But that's our name, my mother said. <laughs> and October 30th, that's today. 
Mother sings the music from the television alone. The Sanchez Circus. <laughs> what is that supposed to be? I don't know what happened. That's just the way it was. And then I heard Maria Peppa on the stairs. She sneaks along the stairs. I think she listens at people's doors. But of course she listens at people's doors. <laughs> and I pull the door open and say, Maria Peppa, if you don't get your washing machine repaired, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to strangle you. And she says, why? Why? <laughs> because you flood the whole house and then there's a short circuit. Power cut, no TV. And she says, you had a power cut? I didn't have a power cut. I wasn't even doing any laundry, so. So, does that mean you missed your show? Yes! She says, shall I tell you what happened? I'll tell you. Listen, it was really, but hey, did you see that man? What man? The man who was standing outside the house. He had something in his hands, looking at a package. <laughs> didn't he knock on your door? <laughs> Oh yes, no idea. And she slammed the door shut. And then we sat there and we didn't know what to do. And Mama flicked through the old calendar from Western Union. And suddenly, she got a real far away look. What is it? You're looking so... And she said nothing. She looked into the distance. With a smile. What is it? What's wrong? And then she said, Oh, nothing. I just remembered something. Oh, what? <sighs> and I, I wondered if anyone looks at us from above the way I look at ants whether anyone ever puts a grain of rice in our way, although they're about to eat us up. And I thought, I would like to be able to fly. I'd like to know how everything here looks from above. And then my grandmother stuck a spoon in her mouth, just like that. <laughs> and that looks so stupid. It looks so funny that we all had to laugh. And I put the wig on, and then we laughed even more. The grandmother puts the spoon in her mouth. Her granddaughter puts on the wig. Nobody laughs. <laughs> Wigs are funny. <laughs> it tastes of jam. The spoon tastes of jam. And we laughed and we laughed. Jam. <laughs> they didn't even wash the spoon. <laughs> Perhaps they don't have any washing up liquid. We cried with laughter. And Grandfather laughed too. It was just too funny. No, really, it tastes of jam. Or, no, it tastes, it tastes of, it tastes of capers. <laughs> capers? What are capers? And how do you know what they taste like? Well, I, I used to eat them before. It's a long time ago. But now I remember. Here, try it. The daughter puts the spoon in her mouth. Capers taste like, but this tastes of pears. No, it tastes of basil. <laughs> the boyfriend plays with the pen. Click, 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 click. And my boyfriend, he was writing something down with the pen. He was making notes with the pen that was in the package. He'd never done that before. The boyfriend gets a piece of paper and writes something down. What are you writing? And he said, Oh, nothing, nothing. What? Nothing, nothing. He's writing a poem, said my grandmother. I believe he's writing a poem. Do you write poems now? It's nice we've got one creative person in the family. <laughs> <laughs> nice that this junk inspires at least one person. And I, I still had the weight on my head. I thought, I would so like to be able to fly. I thought, I would so like to be able to see everything from above, whether we look like ants. There was nothing in it. The calendar was empty as a desert. And then I got stuck this one day on September 29th, 22 years ago. And my grandfather pours himself a drink. 
using the empty mustard jar which had been in the package. Boyfriend pours himself a drink. Today I'm going to have a drink, he says. And he hasn't drunk for years. But there again, if you've waited for something 42 years, and then he tips the jar, the whole jar full. Boyfriend drinks the contents of the jar in one. And the jar does not empty. When he puts the jar down, it's full, full to the brim. <clears throat> what is that? He looks at the jar incredulously. Did you see that? Yes, I saw it, and if you're going to start getting drunk again, no, you better tell me so, I can throw you out now. No, no, I mean, did you see that? Look. He takes the full jar and pours it back. When he puts it down, it is full to the brim. The jar is full to the brim. Empty, and at the same time, full to the brim. What? That's impossible. And my mother takes the jar, the full jar, and drinks it down in one. And when she puts it down, the jar is full. She laughs. <laughs> Empty and full. Can't believe it. And then I had a drink, even though I don't normally drink much. Never, but... She drinks. <laughs> And it was true. She holds the empty jar in the air. Full. And my boyfriend had a drink too, and he really can't take a drop of this stuff. Boyfriend <laughs> also drinks, slurping rather awkwardly. And then I had a drink, and the jar was full the whole time. Daughter drinks. I think, my grandfather said, I think we're better off not telling anybody. We're better off not telling anybody. We'd better not tell anyone. And then? Then... I slowly floated up to the ceiling. I could fly. <laughs> I was flying. I flew up to the ceiling. What's going on now? He really was writing a poem with the pen from the package. I could see that straight away up from up there when I was floating up on the ceiling. Come down from there, you'll break your neck. We're better off not telling anybody. We're better, we'd better not tell anyone. The group sinks back into silence. Now and then, someone looks up at the ceiling, someone puts the spoon in their mouth, or someone flicks through the calendar. Someone sips from the jar. The boyfriend plays with the pen. And I said, look out! But she was already out to the window. And I flew out into the night, into the darkness. I stayed, hovering in the air outside the window to our apartment for a moment and my boyfriend tried to hold on to my foot. Boyfriend throws himself onto the floor in order to grab his girlfriend's foot. But I, I kept climbing higher and higher into the air, floor by floor, and then I flew past the electric wires and I flew over the roofs of our neighborhood. The thousand lights in the darkness, the cars, the people beneath me in the light of the street lamps. It was, it was incredibly beautiful. The wind in my hair. In my dress, I, I kept flying higher, but it was cold up there. The higher I flew, the colder it became. I see cold. And it was so quiet up there, dead quiet, nothing could be heard. And I've got such good hearing. What was it like up there? Tell me. I... I've written a poem for you. Oh, yes? You want to hear it? it it's, a, it's about a snowflake. <laughs> it's a love poem. <laughs> it was a beautiful poem. It really was a beautiful poem, but I, I couldn't listen properly. In my thoughts, I, I was just somewhere else. I was still up there in the air. She cries a little. I really wanted to go straight back up in the air. It was so beautiful up there, but I was so cold. Tomorrow, I'll write you another poem, or today even. <laughs> it hadn't been easy coming back. Landing. Flying high was easy, but landing. On the way back, I flew past the windows of the big hotel, down in the corner. And in the hotel rooms, I saw strange people. 
doing strange things. And in one room, I saw, I think, my friend Dolores. What's she doing in that hotel? She can't afford that. Dolores was with a man. With a man who was not from here. And she didn't look happy. She smiled at me, but she had an empty look in her eyes. And then I was almost home, down in the street again, and I thought, oh well, now I need to walk the seven blocks home, but then a gust of wind lifted me up again. And when I finally flew in through our window and sat back down on the sofa again, everybody stared at me. What was it like? Tell us, what was it like? But I didn't want to tell them anything, nothing. I was just incredibly cold. Sometimes I think the story should be told backwards from the end to the beginning. Isn't mm -hmm. that be better? Because so, so everybody would know what happened. Well, but that won't work because how can anybody understand what's happened if they don't know how it could come about? Sanchez Circus. Yes, we had a range of attractions. We had the jar that was never empty. We had the spoon of a thousand flavors. We had the calendar of the past. We had the romantic pen. We had the flying blonde. And we had the snowflake. It tasted so good. The spoon tasted so good. Uh, that night, that night I woke up and I couldn't stop myself. I went into the kitchen. It, it was around four o'clock in the morning or a quarter past four and the spoon was lying there, the spoon from the package. And I couldn't put it in my mouth. And the spoon tasted of honey. <laughs> and after that, it tasted of strawberries and cream. And after that, it tasted and then I heard a quiet noise, a noise like a sobbing. I jumped, I almost dropped the spoon. Someone was sitting there on the sofa in the darkness. Here, she leaps through the calendar. Here, here on September 29th, 22 years ago, that's when I, I had forgotten. I had forgotten what it felt like, how it was, what his eyes were like, and now, now it's all there again. Now, now I'm standing in front of him with those eyes. And he says those words that he always used to get around me. And it's 22 years ago now. Huh? That was, that was so beautiful. No, it, it wasn't beautiful. It was precious. I can see him in front of me so clearly. I can almost feel him. She leaps through the calendar. You know, Mama, it's so beautiful and so sad. I can suddenly remember every day, every single day of my life. And here, on July 10th, that's when I got pregnant. And I was so unhappy to begin with. And then, I was so proud. The spoon tasted of mandarins. And then of coriander. And then Dad came into the kitchen. By now, it was already half past four in the morning, and he said, hey, I just wanted to check that you're all okay. And then he had a drink out of the jar that was never empty. Mm -hmm. And then another one. Mm -hmm. And then he went back to bed. The boyfriend clicks the pen excitedly. I wrote with the pen from the package, and she was lying next to me in bed. She slept deeply and soundly, but she was shivering, and she talked in her sleep. The whole city beneath me, like an electric field. Blue, black, red. Every light is sad, and every light is reason to hope. She kept saying, it's so quiet. It's so quiet up here. I think I'm deaf, and I... I'm so cold. Clicking of the pen. I wrote and wrote. And it wasn't cold at all. It was hot. The air conditioning was on, and it wasn't quiet either. It was so loud. The cars, the trucks outside, the dogs barking. I wrote all night. I wrote every night from then on. I couldn't stop. I couldn't. I couldn't put the thing down, the calendar. I just couldn't. And when the sun rose the next morning, I was already up in the air, high up, 
over the city. I, I couldn't do anything else. I would get up in the morning with the calendar already in my hand, and then... We live in a hard country, he said. He said, there's not a lot of love in this country. There's not a lot of real love, but I... I love you with everything I have, with everything I can give you. That's what he said. And he meant it then. And that was here on February 12th. There, that's the date. She shows the empty page in the calendar. She's, she's not unromantic. I mean, you can't say that. <laughs> but she is, she, I know that she loves me in her way, but she doesn't like talking about love. Uh, she doesn't like the word. And sometimes she's so far away, especially now, since, since the package. I read her my poems early in the morning, poems I'd written that night in the night, but she wasn't listening. And when I turned the page or quickly corrected a word and then looked up again, then I just caught sight of her flying out the window. She was flying away. And when she came back, she was as cold as ice. And from then on, it was always like that. Every day. They hum the tune from the television. We'll tell no one. We agreed that. No one will tell no one. Right. Right, if we tell anybody, then it's obvious what's going to happen. All hell is going to be let loose. We'll tell no one, but... But... But how are we going to do that? I didn't tell anybody. Nobody. <coughs> my cousin came really early the next morning. My little cousin. I've got four cousins, and they, well, they've got four husbands. And, uh, so there are always people coming. I was woken up the next morning. He sat next to me on the bed. He had the pens and the package in his hand, my boyfriend. I thought I hadn't had a minute's sleep, and he said, look what I've written. And I, I put the wig on while he was reading something out to me. I don't know, something he'd written. A poem, <laughs> poems. And I, and for my cousin, the spoon tasted of cake and Coca-Cola. And I was already up in the air. There was something else he'd said, but anymore. I was already out of the window. Cake. Chocolate cake. And then, well, then the neighbors are always coming around, too. I, I didn't show it to Paco. No, but I did leave it lying on the counter, the poem. I just kept on writing, or it fell out of my bag the next day in the queue for the bakery. Well, I and as soon as my cousin had left, Teresita came around. Teresita is our neighbor from the third floor. She does my nails sometimes. And for Teresita from the third floor, the spoon tasted of duck with plums. And then he read it. Paco. Paco, who works at the bakery. He read the poem straight away without asking. And I couldn't do anything about it. The poem, uh, it was called, or it is called, Tell Me How the World Looks from Above. I flew over our city in the morning sunshine. It was a clear day. In daylight, the city is gray and green and hard as glass. And the black behind the windows has a bitter taste. And then Teresita hadn't been gone 15 minutes and there was another knock. It was fat Annabelle from next door. She's a nurse. She's a nurse and her husband is a policeman and that has advantages and disadvantages. And fat Annabelle said, is it right? You've got one of those spoons, a special kind of spoon. And I said, what? No, no. what kind of spoon? What kind of special spoon? But she, she put a coin down on the table. And I said, no, really? Yes, yes, you have, yes, you have, she said. Teresita told me, Teresita, who lives here on the third floor. And so, and so, we could make a business out of this. <laughs> I said that. Mm -hmm. And Paco said at the bakery, this is good. Did you just lose that? Did that like, just fall out of your pocket? This is a really, really good poem. Where did you get it from? Did you write that? Wow. Wow. And he whistled through his teeth. 
And for fact, Annabelle, the policeman's wife, the spoon tasted of a freshly seared steak. <laughs> and she was thrilled. Silent chickens. Silent dogs. Silent cars. Silent buses. Silent trucks. All moving. Look, look, I'm really sorry about your TV show, Maria Peppa told me the next day. She said, I swear, I didn't put the washing machine on. She was sitting in our apartment by the kitchen table, Maria Peppa. But if you knew what happened yesterday, you wouldn't believe it. The wicked housekeeper, who recently claimed she was pregnant, now says that her boss's husband, the man with the gold chain. And then Maria Peppa's eyes came to rest on the calendar, which was lying in front of her on the kitchen table. And she said, what's that? And then Maria Peppa picked up the calendar, and she turned the pages. The daughter turns the pages of the calendar. And then she said nothing. She just stared into the distance. The daughter stares into the distance. Maria Peppa suddenly looked 42 years younger. And she cried a little. And then she asked, So, where is your father? And I said, I don't know. I, I think he's gone for a walk. Why? down there? Old people, young people, couples, people on their own, groups of people, no matter who, they all want to go somewhere. They're all looking for something. They're all missing something. And they all look the same, like black dots. And then Rosanna came, Rosanna from the shop across the street, and for her the spoon tasted of tuna fish and grapefruit and fennel, with a little bit of chili, but not too much. <laughs> I've never eaten anything like that, she said. She laughed. It's like an explosion in my mouth. A couple hours later, Paco was at the door. Paco from the bakery, the one who found the poem. And he said, uh, tell me, this poem, your poem, could you lend it to me for a couple of hours? <laughs> You know, there's this woman, not my wife, and I would really like, you know, I think if I read this poem out to her, then maybe I can, look, don't get me wrong, but she's more the romantic type, and I, I don't know the many poems, but your poem, with that, maybe I could. Maria Peppa? <laughs> Maria Peppa has a boyfriend. He's an unpleasant character. Ramon Martinez. Forty years ago, he was after my mother, but she already had her eye on my father by then. And this Ramon Martinez, Maria Peppa's boyfriend, he works as a bus driver. And that has its advantages and its disadvantages. <laughs> because he always brings something back with him after he's been away. But he also has a girlfriend in every other town. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that. Maria Peppa knows that too. Mm -hmm. Things like that get around. Everyone talks about it in the queue for the bakery. And Maria and Peppa, Maria Peppa and he often shout at each other late at night, unless our TV show is on. And one evening, Ramon Martinez almost bashed our door down because he was so angry. The boyfriend knocks or bangs on something very loudly. And he said to me, what have you done to Maria Peppa? She's changed completely. All she ever talks about is this calendar you seem to have. Show it to me. And he'd already got a hold of the calendar. And I thought he was going to rip it up. He was going to scatter it in the air in pieces. But then, then his eyes fell on one of the blank pages. And he, he... Ramon Martinez, 62 years old, polygamous bus driver, and an alcoholic for 40 years, suddenly stared into the distance. He could see something in his past. First he smiled, and then he began to cry bitterly. He cried like a child. The next morning, her husband was standing at the door, Fat Annabelle, the nurse's husband, Alfredo Perez, and Alfredo Perez, Fat Annabelle's, the nurse's husband is a policeman. And that has its advantages and its disadvantages. It's over, I thought. It's obvious. The freshly seared steak was just too much. It's over my own fault. He stood there at the door in his policeman uniform and his motorbike was standing outside and he could hear his radio. Tell me, is it true what people are saying? Asked Alfredo Perez, and he spoke in this tone, this police tone. And the next day, Paco was back again. Paco from the bakery, and he said it went well. <laughs> it went really well. I mean, it was, and her husband wasn't at home, you see? So it was really, 
don't worry, it can't be against the law to own a special spoon, Alfredo Perez said. And for him, the spoon tasted of cardamom and saffron and almonds and marzipan. Our street. Our street from above. And two days later, Pedro came. Uh, Pedro Ramirez, he works at the bakery too. He's a friend of Paco's and he said, Sorry, but I've heard from Paco that you've got these poems, and to be honest with you, you know the pretty girl Angelina who sells tomatoes at the market? Well, I, me, you and me, we don't really know each other well, but a poem like that, I can really use that. I can really use that a lot, so if you could write one for me, something about vegetables, maybe? <laughs> the brightly colored roofs, the, the water tanks, some people have built roof gardens, some people Read pigeons and rabbits on their roofs. The laundry flapping in the wind. Maybe you could write a poem about vegetables, he said. <laughs> about tomatoes, things like that. And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> and Pedro Ramirez said, I'll pay you. That's what he said. I'll pay you for it. And then I wrote Pedro Ramirez the poem, The Earth in Your Hands. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great success for him. Uh, not just with Angelina, he used it later on the beautiful Isabel and fat Annabelle. <laughs> Annabelle, she's the wife of the policeman with the motorbike. The people. the people down on the street run backwards and forwards, and sometimes they stop and stand in front of each other for a moment, and then they go their separate ways again. The earth in your hands. That was my first commission poem. <laughs> and that that was just the beginning. At one point, people were practically lining up to try to spoon, and everybody left something on the table. More and more people came. The whole neighborhood came. And the ones who didn't come for the spoon came for the calendar. And then I saw my grandfather from up above. He was sitting down there on the wall, looking out at the sea. He had the jar with him, the jar that was never empty. And at home, no one would have noticed that he wasn't there. There was always people there now, wanting to try the spoon or the calendar. The grandfather was sitting there, tiny, looking out at the sea. I think he was sitting there looking out at where the package had come from. And I shouted, Grandfather! I saw him down there on the wall. He was alone. The beautiful Isabel came. She just came round by chance and she looked in the calendar and she went red and made sounds as if someone was tickling her or something like that. Geraldo Romero came. He works at the university. He's a nuclear physicist or astrophysicist. He always used to want to fly to the moon and when he talked about it, we'd go weak at the knees. Geraldo Romero looked in the calendar and suddenly started speaking another language. It might have been Russian, I don't know. I didn't ask him. And then he started singing. The boyfriend sings a rather sad, beautiful Russian song. And when he closed the calendar, he smiled and said, thank you. And then the next day, my grandfather was sitting there with a woman. And that woman was me and your papa. <laughs> my papa from the second floor who lives above us and who my grandmother says has been after my grandfather for 42 years. And she was drinking out of the jar, too. And I think they were holding hands, but I couldn't be sure of that from up in the air. A lot of people came twice, three times, four times. Ramon Martinez, Maria Peppa's husband, Ramon Martinez came as often as he could, and every time he cried like a child. And the next day, there were a couple of other people there, too. I couldn't make out who. I didn't know these people, and I thought my grandfather didn't know them either. But they all drank out of the jar. And the day after that, there were even more people, more and more of them, all these strangers drinking out of the jar. The beautiful Isabel came almost every day after that, and every time she went red and made these noises till I couldn't stand it anymore. Listen, I said, you're not alone here. And then one day there was an <laughs> argument. I couldn't hear what the people were saying, but it was clear to see. They began hitting each other, and Grandfather stood on the fringes, but he still had the jar. He was holding it as tightly as he could. And I tried to fly home to tell Mama about it and my boyfriend, but it got harder and harder to fly back. I couldn't get down. It was as if I couldn't 
make any headway against the wind, though it wasn't so windy. Perhaps I was just too light. Some things people didn't like the taste of, things they didn't know, things that were too hot, chili, curry, ginger, they didn't like them, and they complained and wanted their money back. But the spoon is the spoon, and once you've paid, you've paid. Mm -hmm. Finally, I flew past the windows in the big hotel. It was already after sunset. I was fighting my way down against the wind, floor by floor. And in one of the windows, I thought I saw my friend, Del <coughs> my friend Dolores. What's she doing here? She wouldn't even be allowed in here. She can't afford it, I thought, but she was there with a man. And it was not the same one as recently. This one was old and had red hair and was quite fat. And when I finally got back, my grandfather was already home. He had a graze on his head, and he said he'd run into a lamppost. And he still kept tight hold of the jar, like this. Sometimes I think the story should be told backwards from the end to the beginning. Wouldn't that be better? We became rich. But my grandmother didn't care about that. She said she didn't want to share the spoon anymore. We really could use the money. I couldn't sleep anymore. I was afraid someone would break in. I was afraid someone would come and steal the spoon from me. I got rings under my eyes, heart pains. She wasn't well. She got worse and worse. Rosanna from the shop across the street came every day and kept trying the spoon over and over again. Ah, I don't know what it is, she said, but that tastes like Paris, she said. I think that's what Paris tastes like, or that tastes like a poem. The boyfriend keeps on writing. He's not very interested in this part of the story. <laughs> what, are you talking about me? <laughs> and then one day I saw, just when Rosanna was leaving, that the spoon was not lying on the table. Where's the spoon? Where's the spoon? The spoon had wandered into her bag, and I pulled her hair until she was down on her knees, and then she said, I'm sorry, sorry, I, I don't know either how that could have happened to me. And then I hit her again. And at night, we would lie in bed, my boyfriend and I, and I was always so terribly cold. It was so quiet up there, and this quietness was still in my head. In bed at night, I couldn't hear anything anymore. Not the chickens, the dogs, not the cars, the shouting. And he would write and write and write. He, would, he wrote one poem after the next, and they were all for me, he told me. Or most of them were, even though he sold them. Here, what do you think of this? And I said, I don't need a poem. Just kiss me. I said, hold me as tight as you can so I don't fly out of the window. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm freezing to death up there. I became famous. But the next morning, I put on the wig again. I was already up in the air again. I couldn't stop myself, and I didn't even notice. Everyone knew me. Everyone knew my poems. And then, Arnando Lopez came. Arnando Lopez is famous. He's a writer. He knows everyone. He knows everybody. <coughs> He's got influence. And Arnando Lopez said, And then he said, you're good. You're really good. You know what? We'll make a book of yours, a proper book. Or what are we going to call it? And, and I said, Colors of the City. Or, no, of Ant Street. The spoon was addictive. She couldn't put the calendar down. She'd get up in the night over and over again and go into the kitchen to see if the spoon was still there. I started getting up in the night every night, and she... As soon as the last customers had gone, she'd sit on the sofa and stare at the calendar all night. They didn't sleep anymore. We didn't sleep anymore. My grandmother didn't sleep because she was afraid about the spoon. My mother didn't sleep anymore because she stared at the calendar all night. My boyfriend didn't sleep anymore because he rode all night. And I didn't sleep anymore because I was so cold. And my grandfather, sometimes he didn't even come home anymore. And when he did come home, he slept with a jar in his hand. In the newspaper, the newspaper the mustard jar had been wrapped in and which contained all sorts of things we couldn't understand. It said that day, Sanchez Circus closed today due to illness. And then they didn't let anyone in anymore. They didn't open the door anymore. People knocked and knocked. They shouted from the street, but the door stayed shut. Ramon Martinez, Maria Peppa's boyfriend, 
stood outside the door at night and he begged me to let him in. He cried like a wounded animal. He wept. But I didn't open the door. And he kept crying, please, 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 please. Oh, and from then on, Mama Leaf threw the calendar day and night without a break. And she would say with a sigh, all those things we could have done differently.